Good evening. Good evening. It's a real pleasure to be with you tonight, and, uh, and it's a, a pleasure to be able to minister the Word of God this weekend with Brother Raju. Uh, I've met him on one other occasion. He was visiting in the Tampa area, and, uh, and one of the brothers in our assembly, actually a number of brothers in our assembly, are familiar with our brother, and so we, uh, so we invited him over for Sunday. He wasn't there for uh, initially to speak with us, but uh, uh, we invited him over. We had a great Sunday morning together, and uh, we have two meetings in the morning. Maybe you do something like that too. So we had him actually minister at both the meetings that we have. So um, had a wonderful time. Then we had a meal, and uh, we happened to sit across from each other, and my wife and his wife, and uh, us together. And so it was a pleasure. That was my uh, my first and only meeting with him. So it's a pleasure to be with him again tonight. And as I walked in tonight, uh, thinking I'm not going to know very many people here. Uh, I met Sherman probably 20 years ago. He looks about the same as he looked 20 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and a few others I've met too. But I walk in, and who do I see? I see Ben Harrell. Now, if you know, I don't know if you know this brother, maybe he comes here from North Carolina. And then our sound man in the back, I know him from South Florida. I said, what, what is this? <laughs> People from all over that I have a little bit of an acquaintance with uh, coming to uh, Manville Bible Chapel. And so it's a real, it's a real pleasure. Uh, in North Carolina, they have meetings. They have a certain tradition there. Uh, ben knows about this. And uh, once a year, uh, some of the North Carolina churches have revival you know, a number of meetings, but what they do, they call it homecoming, right? You have homecoming, and that's when all the different ones you know come together and they have a number of meetings. So it's like homecoming week for me. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As you're turning there, I'm going to share a little bit about myself, and uh, I won't be very long. And uh, just a little bit to, uh, if you don't know uh, a little bit about me or haven't met before, just share just a little bit about, uh, about my background and uh, so forth. I, um, I was born in South Carolina, and my father was in, a student at Columbia Bible College. Today it's called Columbia International University. And uh, it was 1954, and uh, he was saved just prior to that. He was saved the first time he heard the gospel. Now, that's a very unusual thing. First time he heard the gospel, he was saved. And he soon after that enrolled in Columbia Bible College. And uh, my mother was the daughter of a missionary, missionaries to Cuba. And, uh, and so they began to attend there. But for financial reasons, they didn't finish. Almost finished, but didn't quite finish. Didn't go into ministry. We moved back to New Jersey, and that's where I grew up. I grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in an uh, exclusive brethren assembly. I don't know if that means anything to many of you, but it's just a very conservative type of uh, uh, assembly meeting. And uh, just a handful of people. It grew in the 70s to be 75 or 80 people. And uh, we had guitars and contemporary music like that at our, at our, uh, at our exclusive brethren assembly. And uh, not during the meetings, but at other times, <laughs> not at breaking of bread, but at other times uh, in parks and in coffee houses and many places uh, during the Jesus movement, uh, it was a little bit different than most exclusive brethren meetings, and that's the kind of a little bit how I grew up. I'll tell you a very quick story. My sister got saved, and she got involved in the Jesus movement. I was 14. She was about 16 or 17, and uh, began to go to a coffee house, and pretty soon they had this gathering of 30 or 40 hippies that got saved, and they went to church to church, and they said, you know, we, we're saved, we want to go to church. And the churches wouldn't accept them. They had long hair. One of the guys named Mark couldn't see his face. 
His hair was all his, we couldn't even see his face. I think I, I knew what he looked like for about 10 years. And uh, so he went from church to church, came to our exclusive brethren church. Well, actually, they only came, they came to a Bible study, but they never came initially. But they came to my father. And they said, can we use your garage? We want to get our own church. Can we use the garage? Here's the garage wall. Here's where the exclusive brethren met in the living room. And so he said, okay. What would you say? He said, okay. So they come one Saturday, take all the bicycles out, everything out, put it under the patio, paint the floor green, put a big cross, gold cross in the middle of the garage, put a couple of One Way to Jesus posters on the wall, and they began to meet there. A couple of Sundays, we met in the living room. We go out on the grass, the front lawn. I've got a couple of pictures of us still meeting there, 1969, 1970. And so the exclusive group went out on the front lawn, and the, the, the hippies went out on the front lawn. And after about three or four or five weeks, they said, why don't we just join together? Why should we be in the garage and have the wall between it? And you, let's just join together. They did that. That was our hippie church, hippie, hippie exclusive brethren, only one in America, <laughs> only one in the world, I'd venture to say. It grew out of that living room into a, a room above the fire station in our town. And uh, many, many people got saved and uh, many baptized. Remember, I remember 25 people being baptized at one time in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, on one occasion. Many people got saved over the years. That was my upbringing. And uh, after I got saved, I went, uh, went to Belgium as a missionary for, uh, for a little bit, about eight years, eight or nine years. I came back and I've been involved in full-time work uh, in, uh, in the United States. And uh, I was commended in 1983, so I've been a little over 40 years in the Lord's work. I know you look at me and you say, you look too young. <laughs> you look way too young to be, be 40 years. But uh, a little over 40 years in the Lord's work. I've written a number of books. I've been involved in a number of different ministries. Uh, currently, I'm involved with Cornerstone Magazine. I've got three children. Um, I've got an older daughter and then a son and a, uh, a younger daughter. My youngest daughter, she, uh, she's a, the editor of Missions Magazine. So I always bring some copies with me, try to drum up a few more subscriptions to uh, Missions Magazine. So if you do not receive it, there's some copies in the back. There's a sign-up sheet and uh, also a sign-up sheet for, uh, for Cornerstone Magazine. If you don't receive that uh, mail to your house, we'd love to have you sign up and be a part of that. So that's just a little background uh, about, about myself. I want to talk to you about tonight about what I think is one of the most important doctrines uh, in the New Testament. It wasn't always considered a very important doctrine. In matter of fact, for years and centuries, it was an unknown, an unknown almost unknown doctrine and generations would go by. But in the 1800s, it was rediscovered and it began to be preached in a powerful way from the 1850s into the 1950s and 60s and, and a little further beyond that. But especially in that 100-year period of time, uh, it was preached in a powerful way. And through, through the preaching of that doctrine, and that doctrine is, we find it in doctrine about, about that and other things related to it in 211 chapters of the New Testament. Great part of the New Testament is about that particular doctrine. And in the preaching of that doctrine, there was a revival in, uh, there was a renewed interest in revival and evangelism. Hundreds and hundreds of people were saved throughout the world. Missionaries were sent because, largely because of this, dark, of this doctrine throughout the world, there's a church historian. He said about 70% of the missionaries 
in the early 1900s went to the mission field because of this doctrine. 70% of those that were on the field. Bible institutes and Bible colleges and seminaries were established in this time largely because of that doctrine. Dallas Theological Seminary was founded in 1924. Other Bible institutes were started. The Bible college that I went to, the seminary that I attended, Alliance Theological Seminary in Nyack, New York, was started in the late 1800s, largely because of this doctrine. And this doctrine has had, has been one of the most powerful impacts, had most, one of the most powerful impacts, I think, on the church uh, than almost any other doctrine that we know of. And that doctrine is the rapture of the church we find it in the chapter that I mentioned to you before, chapter 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 4. And uh, we're going to look at that doctrine tonight. And uh, this doctrine is not preached as vigorously and as powerfully and with as much conviction as it once was preached. I know many people who are saved in the preaching of this doctrine. In the 1970s, during the Jesus Revolution, this doctrine was at the forefront of that movement. I heard messages over and over again in that time period, and many, many people got saved. Many of them got saved through the preaching of that doctrine. And so we want to look at it tonight. We want to think about it together. And so follow with me as I begin to read. Uh, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians, verse 13, to the end of the chapter. But I, have you, I, would ha I would have you not to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Them also who sleep in Jesus, God will, bring, will God bring with him. For this we say to, you on, uh, say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise, shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. For many, many years, this, this passage and this doctrine has been confused with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This has been read, if you read the commentary in Matthew Henry, he will, he will say this is about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's some great differences between what we read here and what we read about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes to earth, and he comes to earth to judge. He puts his feet, his feet stand upon the Mount of Olives. Amen. And he comes into this world to judge at the end of the tribulation period and to rule and reign and enter the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not what happens here. When he comes in the second coming, he comes to judge the world and usher in uh, the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus, but to judge the world. Here, he comes for believers. Amen. He comes for those who are dead in Christ. He doesn't come to rule and reign. He come, doesn't come to judge. He doesn't come in the second coming. This is a special coming Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this coming, he's coming for believers to catch them up together with him that they as it says in the passage, so we would ever be with the Lord. From this point, 
in biblical history, we will never be separated from the Lord Jesus Christ again. We shall forever be with the Lord. Amen. Not that we'll be with the Lord until, until the millennial kingdom. Not that we should be with the Lord until a certain period. We shall forever be with the Lord. After this event, we will forever be with the Lord. What a wonderful truth that is. Isn't that a thrilling truth? Now, some people would say, and I've wondered myself, why is this doctrine so endearing, so beloved for many, many centuries, or many, many, many generations, loved, books have been written about it, songs have been written about it, hymns have been written about it. Why is it so beloved? Why do so many people enjoy this particular doctrine among many other, above many other doctrines? And I think it's for the reason that it's very personal. It's very intimate. It's, it's, an, it's an act of love. It's an act of intimacy between the Lord Jesus Christ and his, and his saints. We are his bride. I was reading on the internet. It happened to be an article from, uh, from uh, Friends of Israel. And the article was called, Why Will the Lord Jesus Christ Come for His Church? And that kind of got my attention. Gave okay, five reasons. Five reasons why the Lord Jesus will come in the rapture. Now, all of those reasons, I could tell you what they are, but of all the reasons, he didn't mention this one, which I think is the chief reason. He comes because he loves us. Amen. He comes because we're his bride. He comes because he loved us and he gave himself for us. He loved the church and he gave himself for it. That's why he comes. He comes to unite himself with his bride. That's what we are. That's personal. That's intimate. When you read in, in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go for you. And if I go, I will come again that where I am, you may be also forever and ever and ever. That's very personal, isn't it? I'm coming for you. I'm coming for my bride. I'm coming for believers. I'm not coming to judge in this particular act, uh, uh, aspect. I'm coming to receive a bride to myself. So when we come to this passage, he says, the dead in Christ, those who are in Christ, those for whom he died, those for whom he went to the cross of Calvary and laid down his life, those for whom we read in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And as we believe in that finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary made provision for salvation for every man, woman, and child, and everyone that believes is in Christ. As we read here, the dead in Christ, the living in Christ. We caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's a couple of truths about the, uh, the rapture of the church that I think is very important. Number one, is pre-tribulational. It will take place. We don't know when it will take place. It's the imminent return. It's imminent, but it's pre-tribulational. It will happen before the tribulation that will come upon all the earth to try all that is upon the earth. It will happen before that. It's pre-tribulational. You will not go through the tribulation period. Amen. We'll be raptured before that time. We'll be caught up before that time. <clears throat> this good brother bought me a bottle of water here. I thought, I don't need that water yet, but uh, apparently I do. It's pre-tribulational. 
from chapter 6 through chapter 19 of Revelation, the church is never mentioned. I want you to take your Bibles for a moment. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. We're not going to spend much time thinking about this. I just want to state it. It's pre-tribulational. Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is just this, the, the, the portion that we want to read is right before the seventh trumpet will be blown or sounded. Middle, almost middle of the tribulation period. Not in the beginning, <clears throat> but in the middle of the tribulation period. I want to ask you this question based upon this verse. Where are you? Where are you in this verse? And this is one of my favorite passages in Revelation. Favorite, favorite, favorite passage. Just thrills, thrills my heart, thrills my, my soul. 15, verse 15, Revelation chapter 11. And the seventh angel sounded, this is the trumpet, sounded the trumpet. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of the Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever. Amen. Kingdoms are not yet. There's much, there's a little bit more time. There's going to be the, the bold judgments that will have to be poured out upon the earth. But here he states a fact. He will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. And when that seventh angel sounded, when those voices announces great truth. What happens in verse 16? This is what I love. What happens in verse 16? What an awesome sight this is. One thing I love about Revelation, there's so many awesome, amazing, uh, humbling, Christ-exalting and Christ-elevating uh, passages of Scripture about his, his, his attributes, his power, and his judgment, and all that he will do one day. It says in verse 16, the four and 20 elders. Now, who are the four and 20 elders? The four and 20 elders are you and I. It's a representative number of all those that are in the church, all those that are raptured in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. It's a representative number of all those that are believers in the church age. And the four and 20 elders, they're sitting on thrones. Notice what it says in verse 16. And the four and twenty elders who sat before God on their thrones. Now I'm going to pause there for a moment. Now where is this scene taking place? Where is God on his throne? You don't have to answer it out loud. But he's in heaven. He's in heaven. And where, where is the church in the middle of the tribulation period? They're in heaven. And they're on thrones. And they've been through the judgment seat of Christ and they've been granted thrones and granted crowns which previously they've cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're before the presence of God. And then notice what it says. This is what I like. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when this happens? It's awesome enough <clears throat> just to be in heaven and just to be in the presence of Christ for eternity. But when we hear that, that seventh trumpet sound, and those voices saying, the kingdoms of this world, or the kingdom of this world, has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. When that is sounded, the church on their thrones fall on their faces. Look what it says in verse 16 fell upon their faces, and they worshiped God. Amen. Now, they've been worshiping God all through this period of time in Revelation. But they're in heaven. The point that I want to make is they're in heaven. They're not going through the tribulation period. They're raptured out before that period of time. And we read about that rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, raptured out before that time. It's pre-tribulational. It's imminent. It's sudden. 
And when we are raptured, we will have tra our bodies will be transformed. These lowly bodies will be transformed to be like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In my time remaining, I want to look at two doctrines, two or three things. I want to look at the imminent return of the Lord Jesus. What does it mean when we speak about the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ? And then I want to think with you a little bit about the whole idea of that we will have our bodies transformed. And so we're staying in the passage that we have before us. What does it mean? What does the word imminent mean? It doesn't mean, sometimes we say, we use the word imminent, and we don't use it every day. It's not a very common word that we use in common parlance uh, here in, in Texas or in Florida or anywhere else probably in, in North America. But sometimes when it is used, it has the idea of something that's going to happen very, very, very soon. The Bucks in Tampa, Florida are going to win the Super Bowl. Now, if I said that a few years ago, and, and that might be imminent, it might seem to be imminent, now it's very, very far away. Something that's going to happen very soon. But it doesn't have that idea. It doesn't have the idea that something's going to happen very soon. It's something that is going to happen suddenly, something that's going to happen Suddenly, in a time, it could be very soon, it could be a little further away, but we expect it to happen at any time. They say that the San Andreas Fault in California uh, in, in, uh, in, um, in March, I'll be going to uh, San Francisco for some meetings, and uh, I don't know how close I'll be to the San Andreas Fault, but they say they could happen at any moment. That's the idea of imminence. Not always right away, but it could happen at any moment. It's imminent. The, the San Andreas Fault and an earthquake and the separation could happen at any time. That's imminent. It's a story told about a man who was a gardener and uh, of a great estate, and uh, his the owner would come every month to see, stay for a period of time, see what was going on, look at the gardens, look at the estate, enjoy, and then he would leave. And the gardener would work and labor in this estate. That was his work. That was his job. At one time, a visitor came, and the visitor said, is the owner here? He said, no, he's not here right now. He said, when will he come back? He said, I don't know when he will come back, but I know that he will come back. He always comes back. He will come back. That's the idea of imminency. We don't know when he's going to come back. It's been 2,000 years since the Lord left. And we read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, as you see him, as the disciples saw him, ascended to heaven, the angel said, just as you saw him depart, he will come again in the same manner. <clears throat> he will come again. The imminent return is that he's going to come at any moment. It's at any moment return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in the expectancy, in the eager expectancy of the any moment return of the Lord Jesus Christ. For this, this event to happen, this incredible, wonderful, tremendous event that we will be a part of, the greatest event of our lives, it could happen at any moment. Horatius Bonar used to say, used to use the word, perhaps today. That's imminency. Perhaps today. At any moment, the any moment return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We might look at signs and we say, might say he's coming is soon. We might look at the Middle East and we say he's coming is soon. But we don't know. But many other events down through history. But the Lord's return is imminent. Now, I want to look at a few verses with you. We're going to, keep, we're going to come back to this passage. So um, 
keep your finger in uh, chapter four. If you've got an electronic device, do, do whatever you do to keep your finger in that chapter. Uh, I'm not sure how that all works, but I'm sure there's a way to do that. And then we will we'll come back to it in a, in a second. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, verse 22, early believers would use this term, Maranatha. And the word Maranatha means this, the Lord comes. They would greet each other with that word. If you met, I've met Ben, I'd give him a hug, I'd say to him, Maranatha. I didn't say that tonight, but that's what they would do. They would say, Maranatha. They would comfort one another, they would encourage one another by the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. Maranatha. In, uh, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, the Lord is near. The Lord's coming is near. Believers wrote in this way. Writers of Scripture wrote in this way. The Apostle Paul would write and encourage believers in this way. The Lord's coming is near. The Lord comes. We read in <clears throat> we read in Philippians, we're going to come back to that. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look for a Savior, who shall transform these lowly bodies, King James says these vile bodies, to be like his glorious body. Now I want to quote that to you again in a newer translation. What I just, transla what I just quoted to you is from the King James Newer translations, the NIV, Newer American Standard, they, they translate it a little bit differently. And they take that word wait to wait from our Savior from heaven. And they translate it a little bit differently. The word wait has a, a, stronger, a stronger understanding than just, just to, uh, uh, just to uh, wait, just to take time and just have an expectation it means to eagerly wait. So the NIV says, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence we eagerly wait for our Savior from heaven. What a beautiful thought. Eagerly wait for our Savior from heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, we read this. Awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. There was that expectation, that any moment expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Not forsaking. I'm sorry, 928. So Christ will appear a second time. For salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait for him. You went to 1 Peter. Do that with me for a moment. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Here in this passage, we'll be looking at the idea of eagerly waiting for the Lord. When you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and verses 12 and 13, 12, 13, 14, we have a word there. We have a word uh, that sometimes when we look at it, it's, it doesn't have the idea of just physically look, looking for the Lord as if we were physically looking to the sky. It's, re it's repeated three times, this word look. So look with me at, uh, at this word look. Verse 12, looking, and looking for in the hastening of the coming of the day of God. The day of God is the day of eternity. The day when we will be with the Lord in the eternal state. Looking for and hastening the day of God. Look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth. And then down in verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found 
in peace without spot and blameless. Three times, look, look at the, in regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's interesting if you look at other translations, this word look has a deeper and wider meaning than that. It's this look in anticipation, this look in expectancy of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Now, I, when I was in school, I'm sure Roger did very well in school, and probably some of you did. I know John, John over here did very well in school. Uh, I didn't do very well in school. Uh, I, had, I had dyslexia. I had, had an excuse. But uh, in high school, well, I failed third grade, and, uh, and so forth. I, did, I didn't do very well. And then when I got to high school, we had 196 kids in the class, and I, I was 165. So I, I was, you know, I was near the lower... <laughs> Lower and lower area there. No one was giving me any prizes or any scholarships uh, to go anywhere. So when I began to read about this word in commentaries, I began to use these two words, expectation or expe expectancy and anticipation. Expectancy and anticipation. And I, I really didn't know the difference between those. I, I don't know if you, you probably know that right away. Some of you right away know what that means. So I had to look up in a dictionary. Apparently, expectation is based upon fact. You expect something to happen. It's a fact. You expect little children in December expect Christmas Day to happen. There's no doubt that that's going to happen. Expect it to happen based upon fact. And that's part of the meaning of this verse. Looking with expectancy. Because the Lord is going to come. They said earlier in chapter 3, scoffers and mockers, where is the coming of the Lord? All things continue as they come. Uh, they, all, all things continue as they always have gone. But then it says, a little bit later in this passage, the Lord is not slow, slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness. But he's long-suffering and not wanting any to perish, but all would come to repentance. But he will come. It's a fact that he will come. There's expectancy. Now, anticipation is something you look forward to that is a pleasurable thing. You anticipate something very pleasurable, and that is the coming of the Lord. There's expectancy, and there's anticipation, and there's eagerness in the coming of the Lord. Now, let's go back to our passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I noticed the brethren here put a very large clock <laughs> in, uh, in the back of the room. We were uh, at the National Workers and Elders Conference in Greens uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. They had the biggest clock in the history of churches. It was right here. <laughs> it was about three feet high and about four feet wide. And you remember you saw it? Right, right in front of the pulpit. But I'll, um, we'll stop on time. Back to our passage. The writers of Scripture and believers of the New, uh, the New Testament, they believed, they personally believed in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul says. Notice how he writes. Verse, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now notice verse 17. It says this, and we, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Now doesn't it give the indication that the apostle Paul believed in the imminent return in his lifetime he could have written, if he thought it would be a, a thousand years in the future, he could have written this, verse 17, then those that are alive, 
and we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds. But he says when, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds, believed in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus, and it makes us live differently, it makes us think differently. It gives us a greater love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It affects our lives. The coming of the Lord affects our lives. And so they believed in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why hasn't he come? Back to, to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. The mockers and the scoffers said, where's the promise of his coming? And he says, he says, don't count time the way man counts time. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. It doesn't mean the day is a thousand years. But just give me an idea, it's with the Lord, it's different. We can't measure time like the Lord measures time. But then he says this, the Lord is long-suffering and doesn't want any to perish. Why hasn't he come? You know, I enjoyed hearing John MacArthur make this comment. Someone asked him, and he quoted that verse, why hasn't the Lord come? If they believed in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus, why hasn't he come? Well, he hasn't come because he's long-suffering, and he doesn't want any to perish, but wants all to come to repentance. He wants more to be saved. He will come. He definitely will come, it is a fact, but he hasn't come yet because he wants more to be saved. You know, I'm so thankful for that fact. Maybe you're thankful for that too. I'm so thankful, and I was saved in, in 1978, but I'm so thankful the Lord didn't come in 1975. <laughs> I'm so thankful he didn't come in 1970. because I wouldn't have been saved. And maybe some of this room wouldn't be saved. And maybe you're not saved tonight. There's still time. The Lord is waiting. He's long suffering and not willing any to perish. It's a doctrine that changes our lives in regard to the gospel. It changes our lives as we look forward to the Lord's coming and one day being with him. He gives us a greater sense of holiness, a greater sense of the Lord's presence when we think of these things. But I want to go with you to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. In verse 20. We've quoted this verse a couple of times, verse 20. But I want to pause for a second. You know, uh, one of the reasons we've been thinking about Christ and the return of the Lord Jesus, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've thought, I've thought about why it's so important. Maybe, maybe you have. Maybe you've heard other preachers speak about it. But one of the things that struck me, one of the things that occurred to me Whenever we look at the events, the end time events concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it always puts the Lord Jesus Christ in the first place. Now today, in this world, I would, I would venture to say he's not in the first place almost anywhere. Local assemblies, yes. But in the media, he's not in the first place. In art, he's not in the first place. In sports, he's not in the first place. Maybe in certain lives of certain players he is, but generally in sports he's not in the first place. There's almost no place in, in politics he's not in the first place. In athletics he's not in the first place. There's hardly any place in the world today where the Lord Jesus Christ is in the first place or anywhere near the first place. But when you come to the events of prophecy, when you come to the rapture, well, he's in the first place. The Lord will descend. And we'll be caught up together with him. And so shall we be, ever be with the Lord. He'll be on his throne. We'll be around him for eternity. 
He's in the first place in the rapture, the translation of the church. In the tribulation period, he's in the first place in the tribulation period. The Antichrist shakes his fist at heaven. Chapter 6, as that judgment, the seal judgments fall, they hide themselves, it says, from the Lamb who brings that judgment. He's in the first place in the tribulation period. In the millennial kingdom, he's in the first place. In the white throne judgment, he's in the first place. In the judgment seat of Christ, he's in the first place. He sits on that Bema seat. When, the, when prophecy begins, when these acts of prophecy, these events of prophecy begin to break in this world, the Lord Jesus Christ will be in the first place. And he will never cease from that point of time all the way through eternity Amen. to have the first place. That's why prophecy is so important. It thrills our hearts and it puts Christ back where he should be in the first place. But chapter 3 of Philippians and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. From which or from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our lowly body and might be fashioned like his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. We will one day have bodies like unto the body of the Lord Jesus. I want to consider a little bit, a little bit this body of the Lord Jesus, this glorious body. There's some debate about the resurrection body and the glorious body, whether they're, they're different, but I, th I think we're talking about the same, the same thing, the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples were gathered because of the fear of the Romans in chapter 20 of John's gospel. They were gathered together in a in the locked room. And the Lord Jesus somehow appears to them, just appears to them. The door doesn't open. They didn't unlock it. He appears in their midst and he says, Peace unto you. There's some ability in the, in the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus to, uh, to move through walls, has some. some quality within the resurrection body to do that. There's something in the resurrection body that can move quickly from place to place. He could be with disciples on the road to Emmaus and talk with them. And they can say, did not our hearts burn when he spoke with us? And then he can move to another place very quickly. We see this, this unique resurrection body of the Lord Jesus. We read in scripture, we'll not get sick, we'll not get ill. We will not age. We will not get older. I was on the airplane today, and there was an older gentleman, and in a little time getting up. It wasn't me. It was, it was, somebody, it was somebody else. But, uh, and he turned to somebody and he said, he said, are you all right? He said, yes, it's just age. I'm just getting older. We're not going to be getting older in the eternal state. We're not going to doctors. I'm not going to go to dentists. Just recently, I had cataract surgery. You probably saw me doing this, you know, trying to hold this up like that because my eyes are not wholly 100% what they should be. But we're not going to have cataract surgery in heaven, internal state. We're not going to have any of those kind of things. We're not going to have, we're going to have bodies, resurrection bodies like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll have that for all eternity. But there's some special things about this, this glorious body that I, want to, that I want to mention to you that I think is very special. It appears that when we're in heaven in our eternal state, we'll be able, we'll be able to know one another. We'll know one another <clears throat> even if it seems, even if we didn't know them very well in life. If you had a great grandfather who you never met but was a believer, it seems from scripture that you will know him when you're in heaven. I had a young man come up to me 
And he said to me, when I get to heaven, will I know C.H. Spurgeon? <laughs> well, I know who he is. Now, the disciples in chapter 21, when they were fishing, the Lord Jesus came. They called out to him, and they, they said, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. They looked. John looked. It's the Lord. Peter threw off his cloak. He swam quickly. It's the Lord. They knew the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus. He may have been different, somewhat different, than his, his former body, but they recognized him. We'll be able to recognize people. Now, think of this. Now, I'm not saying they had resurrection bodies, but they certainly had different bodies. When Moses and Elijah were on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples recognized who they were. Should we make tabernacles for Moses and Elijah? Some indication that, now they never knew, they never knew what Moses and Elijah looked like, but they were able to recognize them. And it seems like we'll have some ability to recognize one another and recognize loved ones whom we never knew what they looked like in their earthly life. I look forward to that. I look forward to that. I look forward to meeting D.L. Moody and talking to him and maybe him talking to me and other great heroes of the faith <clears throat> and other loved ones and believers and family members who knew the Lord Jesus. On my mother's side, there's Christians who go back four, four generations. And my wife's side... My, and, 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 uh, my wife's family, both, uh, both sides of the family, they go back four or five generations of believers. They'll be able to know people they never saw before, know them, interact with them. There was a great preacher. Maybe you've heard of him. His name was Harold Wildish. If you've never heard of Harold Wildish, you can go in Voices for Christ and you can listen to many of his messages. Uh, Harold Wildish came from Great Britain. He meant to go to Ecuador as a missionary, but the climate was, was, uh, was difficult for his wife, and so they're on their way back to Great Britain. And on the way back, they had some friends in Jamaica. And they said, let's stop and see some friends in Jamaica. And so they went to Jamaica, and they never left. And he was a missionary in Jamaica for many, many years. He was a great evangelist. I enc encourage you to listen to his messages. Uh, just tremendous evangelist. And, and hundreds and hundreds got saved. When I was in, uh, a few years ago, now many of them have passed, but a few years ago, if I would go to an older believer in the assemblies from Jamaica, and I would say, how did you get saved? And they would say, I was saved through Harold Wildish. Brother was in our assembly. He's passed away now. His name is George. I said, George, how did you get saved? He said, the preaching of Harold Wildish. We've got a brother uh, in our assembly. He's 88. I said to him, Conrad, how did you get saved? Through the preaching of Harold Wildish. So many, many people got saved through Harold Wildish. So I was listening to him on a sermon. And I want to share a little story about the eternal state and about these transformed bodies. And then we're going to close in prayer. So he was preaching and said, I envision one day being in heaven, skipping along the fields of heaven, and then far in front of me on the path coming towards me, I see a figure. And he gets closer and closer. And we meet and we stop each other. And I say to him, when we were down in the regions below, he said, how are you called? What was your name? He said, I always fear this moment when we're in heaven. He says, my, my name is Zephaniah. He said, said, I would say to him, I said, you are one of the prophets, Old Testament prophets, who penned the book of Zephaniah. He says, yes. Then we talk for a little bit. He says, but then I fear he's going to ask me a question. And the question is this. He's going to say to me, 
Harold, did you ever read my book? <laughs> so I make sure I read the Minor Prophets. I make sure I read Zephaniah especially, because no one reads Zephaniah. But then I fear another question might come from, from Zephaniah. After he says, did you read my book, he might say to me, and what did you get out of it? So I make sure I read it and read a commentary or two about it so I can say something to Zephaniah when I meet him. The coming of the Lord Jesus, the rapture of the church, very, very precious time. Are you looking forward with eagerness and anticipation and expectancy to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for us in the air to catch us up together? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the Apostle Paul says, verse 18, comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. I trust your love is coming. You're looking forward to his coming. And one day we'll be together for all eternity with the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful truth. What a wonderful doctrine. It gripped this world, believers in Great Britain, in the United States, in a powerful way. Missionaries were sent out. Assemblies and churches were established. Churches were established. And I believe if we love the Lord Jesus and love his coming again, something similar like that will happen again. Let's bow our word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time tonight. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your kindness and goodness to us. We thank you that with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Thrill us with this truth. Thrill us with these truths about the Lord's love for his bride, his love for us, his plan for, for us that he has for all eternity. And we pray this and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>